Well, I, I know that a lot of times at the primary level, folks want to look ahead to who they, they hope to face in the general. But, you know, the voters still have that choice in between. So sure. what, what argues for choosing you as opposed to your opponent at the primary level? Well, I'll speak to my qualifications. I was a police officer for 28 years, uh, most of that time in Tucson. I went through the ranks here in Tucson as officer, sergeant, lieutenant, and then captain. Uh, when I retired from TPD, I was commander of the Southside Patrol Division. Uh, during my career, I realized that law enforcement is getting increasingly complex. It's not simple. I started in 1981. Arguably, law enforcement was somewhat simple then. Uh, so I went back to school. I got my undergraduate degree in psychology and, and went on to get my master's degree in criminal justice. Uh, so the breadth of my experience and, and the depth of my education is, is different than my competitor. Now, one of the things we, just the way things stacked up for the day, we ended up talking with him a little while ago, and he was mm -hmm. saying, well, my opponent's been out of law enforcement, active law enforcement for about 10 years, mm -hmm. and things have changed. What do you say to that? Well, first of all, it's not true. Um, I've been out of law enforcement for about uh, just over six years. Uh, so 10 is definitely an exaggeration. Um, but I'll tell you something, and I think I've learned more in the last uh, six years at the university being in a position where I, I look at law enforcement from the outside in as opposed to from the inside out. And I think that's given me a perspective on law enforcement that I could have never gained uh, had I stayed in it. Because you do get uh, a very structured focus on what law enforcement's all about because you're in the inside of it all the time. But to be at the university in uh, you know, senior administration capacity there has allowed me to see it in a different way. Now, what needs to happen differently at the Sheriff's Department? Well, there's a lot. Uh, we need to uh, definitely address uh, employee morale. Um, <laughs> deputy morale is, is very low. Uh, the compensation thing is being played as a political game in an election year, and that's not the way that their compensation should be looked at. Uh, we have a sheriff that's, well, it's a department that's under investigation by the FBI, and that's troubling. Uh, that investigation still looms. I, we don't know what the dispensation of that will be. I think we need to talk more about border safety issues. I think we need to work more cooperatively with um, other law enforcement agencies. Um, there's a lot of opportunity there that's been missed. And we've had internal leadership at the Pima County Sheriff's Department for 40 years. I don't think that's healthy for any organization. So having someone from outside would be better? I, I absolutely believe that the problems in the Sheriff's Department are in the Sheriff's Department and that the solution for those will not be found in the Sheriff's Department. Now, would it be correct to describe most of your policing experience is a relatively pure urban environment? Would that be correct? No, actually, I started my career in Iowa in a, in a relatively small police department um, in the Midwest, which is primarily a farming town of about 40,000 people. Um, so I, that's the first six years of my career right there. Um, my brother-in-law is a deputy sheriff uh, in that uh, uh, county back in, in Iowa. So I've had that kind of experience, and then of course the urban environment, Tucson Police, and then in Glendale where I was assistant director there, that's obviously an urban environment. Uh, so more of it's an urban environment, but my first six years were in a relatively small town. Excuse me. <coughs> when, when we look at the Sheriff's Department, it, it almost seems like as, as lay people it has to have a split personality. Part of their territory is suburban and, and pretty much like a lot of Tucson, and mm -hmm. then a lot of it is rural. What sort of unique challenges does that present? Well, it's a different type of policing, obviously. I mean, there's um, urban policing is, is different. You have a higher concentration of officers in, in that space. There are places where there are just, you know, one deputy on duty for uh, many, many miles. Um, if you go down south of Green Valley and those areas, so it is a different type of law enforcement. There's a different clientele, too. I mean, clearly Green Valley is a lot different than Vail or Sarita or other places in the county. So the, the populace is different and the, the nature of the criminal justice problems are different. Especially when you look at the, the police issues that have, if they aren't brand new, they've at least intensified in the past couple of years. What do you think needs to be done about that? Well, the current um, dialogue is not helping anything. Um, there's a lot of rhetoric flying around and there's enough blame to go around for that. Um, that's not helping anything. I think we really need to be talking constructively about uh, racial issues, about socioeconomic inequalities, and about how law enforcement can better interact with the community. The time to do that is not when crisis hits. Um, that happened in Ferguson, Missouri. They had no relationship with their community at all. And when crisis hit, they had no, no relationship or lines of communication to fall back on. And, and obviously, it, it ended in a very bad way for that community. So I think we need to reach out and be a little bit more honest in our dialogue about these issues. How do you go about that? I mean, you often hear about, yes, let's build a relationship, but you don't often hear specifics of how. 
Well, you can't, you can't do it um, by memorandum. You can't do it by good intention. You have to actually reach out to parts of the community that may be uncomfortable, um, that may not be supportive of law enforcement, and you have to be tenacious about that. And I think you've got to bring the right people to the table. Um, and I did that relatively uh, convincingly as a commander of the Southside Patrol Division. I mean, there are obviously uh, community tensions there. There was a lot of violent crime in the area, but we brought community leaders together and we looked for good solutions to those things. But you have to be willing to put yourself out there and, and develop lines of communication. Now, when you mentioned border issues, would you handle things much differently than, than this department? Among other departments in Arizona, this department and Santa Cruz have had sort of a, a, a different philosophy towards border enforcement? Well, they have. They um, certainly I can speak to Pima County. We've been basically moot on the issue for 30 years. Um, the border is not secure, um, that's a fact, and that presents a national security issue and a, and a public safety issue. I talked to some ranchers uh, a week ago that are afraid to even um, ride the fence lines on their own ranches because it's not safe. We have signs up in our own desert that say it's not safe to go out there. Um, that's, that's a problem, that's a public safety problem. And we don't know who's coming over the border, which is a national security issue. Um, so I think we do need to secure the border. I think we need to talk um, intelligently about doing that. How would you do it? And the definition of what a secure border is seems to vary from based on who you ask. Yeah, it does. I think that the solution is, is human resources and technology, and, and both exist in sufficient ways to secure the border if we were really intent on doing so. Um, we can do it at a much lower cost point than some of the other rhetoric that's flying around out there right now about how to secure the border. But we do need to do that. And then we need to pressure the, the politicians in Washington, D.C. to fix this immigration problem. Um, it's a system that's broken. It's been broken for decades, and nobody does anything about it. Now, when you talk about the nature of securing, a lot of discussion of a wall, however you define a wall, would that work? In my opinion, no. I, I don't think it's a feasible option at all because of the topography of the, de uh, the area. Uh, the cost involved um, and the fact that a wall only solves a certain uh, portion of the problem. Um, I don't think it's feasible to build a wall across the entire uh, expanse of the border. Um, I think you can do it at a much lower cost point, a lot more effectively with technology and human resources. Because uh, you can't effectively wall over a mountain? No, it, it's not, not feasible. And um, what they do, they can go around walls, over walls, walls then require maintenance. Um, how tall is the wall going to be? You know, how tall is the tallest ladder? It's, I mean, there are issues there, obviously. How different would the department look a year or two <clears throat> into your tenure, if you get elected? Well, I think we'd have a sheriff that's much more active um, and would speak out um, intelligently on public safety issues, would reach out to all segments of the media and, and all segments of the political parties. Um, this should not be a partisan issue, and it unfortunately is. It's, there's a lot of partisanship. There should be no partisanship in public safety. Um, I would like to take care of deputy compensation and increase morale in the department so we're not losing the best and brightest deputies that we have and that we make a commitment to compensation that we keep. And then we start retaining and recruiting the best and brightest of the deputies. And the increase in morale will have a corresponding positive impact on performance. How much can a sheriff actually um, influence pay? Because you hit a certain point where they just say, there's simply not enough money, whatever you do. Well, you have to be an advocate for it. You have to make the case. And the case can't be made based on individual deputies saying, I, I'd like these people to make more money. It makes, there's a return on investment here because every deputy we lose, it costs tens of thousands of dollars to train that new deputy and to equip the new deputy. And we can't replace experience. Those are things that cannot be replaced. And they're more critical now because of the nature of law enforcement than they've ever been. And the, and the job market for public safety employees is going to get more and more competitive. I don't want our deputies, the best of our deputies, going to Maricopa County or, or Phoenix Valley cities because they can make $3 an hour more money. And the cost of living up there is not appreciably greater. Now, after your time at TPD, why did you ship to, j jump to a job up there? In the, the Valley? Yes. I, I really liked the chief of police up there. Um, I, I became aware of who he was, and it was an opportunity to do something a little bit different. I had been with TPD 21 years. Um, I've done a lot of things there. I had a lot of assignments. 
Um, the Glendale Police Department, the, the community was growing very rapidly at that point because they just got the stadium up there and um, the chief was the best man I ever worked for. Um, and I thought I could commute for five years from Oral Valley to uh, Glendale. Eventually I'd seen all of Eloy out of my windshield I ever cared to see. I'd listened to every book on tape you could listen to. And um, it became not feasible to do that. The opportunity came to work for the university and um, so I, I moved to the university. Now, are you talking about U of A or is it different? Uh, no, the University of Arizona, yes. Okay. What, what were you doing with them? I, I'm the Associate on? Director of Parking and Transportation. Um, I also have uh, been elected twice to be the uh, Chair of the Appointed Professionals Advisory Council at the University. And in that capacity, I, I represented 4,000 appointed professionals on campus. I was a member of President Hart's Cabinet, um, which I'm very proud of, uh, to be a part of senior leadership at the University. Um, and I've been an active public administrator. We have a budget of about $17 million and 100 regular employees, and we employ 100 uh, additional student employees. Um, I, I thought I'd heard you were doing some sort of uh, instruction on law enforcement I, as well. I, I actually do quite a, quite a lot of stuff. I keep myself very busy. Uh, after I got my graduate degree from Boston University, they hired me as a teacher. Um, I've been teaching for Boston University for the last 11 years. Um, I got promoted to the point at which I supervise other teachers. Um, currently, I'm, I'm teaching and supervising other teachers. I'm teaching victimology for Boston University right now. I have 15 students, and I'm supervising five other teachers. Is that in person or online? Online. Okay. All right. I think that's probably going to do it because, you know, there's a lot of boil down. Sure. Anything you want to add? Uh, no, I just think that it's, it's time for a change. Um, internal leadership um, for any organization for four decades is just not healthy. And um, I'd like to bring that leadership to the Pima County Sheriff's Department. I was here in 2012. I want to be the sheriff then, and, and my desire for that is uh, to serve this county in that capacity is not diminished in any way.